Okay, so uh, we're going to get started here. Um, as you know, I'd like to uh, begin this class trying to impart in a very brief way best practices that will follow us through much of the semester. And today is going to be the uh, final uh, set of these best practices um, that we're going to be covering in kind of a condensed form. Um, I'm expecting to return to much of today's material in uh, separate, separate lectures. You'll recall that um, we finished the uh, last lecture talking about continuous integration, uh, something that had begun in the industry originally as daily builds, um, but is done now uh, in a way that is described as continuous. Again, what do I mean by continuous here? What does that term actually mean in this context? Exactly, exactly. So um, whenever there's an update to the repository, um, there's uh, going to be a build which takes place. And that build will include compilation. But what else will it include besides uh, sort of compilation of code often? Smoke tests, smoke tests good. Yeah, and so that's that's absolutely key. And what's the job of that smoke test? Well, to make sure that the system at least runs at a testable level, that it would be worth to test the system that integrated. Exactly. It's worth it for other people to refresh against that update to the code base. So the the um, the smoke test is not so much designed to ferret out whole new classes of bugs. It's designed to figure out is the system stable enough that people won't get hosed if they refresh against it? Um, and as such, it's kind of a sanity check. And it's an evolving sanity check. Why does it evolve? Why does it have to evolve? Particularly in a project being built from scratch. Yeah, as the system gets bigger, um, as its form starts to take shape, it's, it's got to evolve to track that, or else it's not going to be very meaningful. Um, and in general, ladies and gentlemen, code that's designed to test a system, and I'm including smoke test generously in that, in that category, even though its, its function is really to determine basic sanity of a system. Um, code that's testing a system will need to evolve with the system itself. It's so one of the things that makes testing challenging. It's one of the things that the test team is going to have to worry about here. Because as things evolve in a system, um, older code might have to be updated. And some of that code is in the form of tests, right? They're driving the system. And, and those tests may have to be updated significantly. Now, if those tests operate through interfaces, through contracts that are well-defined, um, it may allow the implementation to evolve with little change to the testing. Um, so one of the ways we insulate ourselves from change is by separating interface from implementation. You, you know, you work in concrete terms in Java, you might work through an interface. You program against an interface. You don't know about the exact underlying class that's being used, you're working against that interface. And then you can evolve the underlying classes over time but the point is, in general, you should expect testing code to break and to have to evolve over time. We'd like to insulate ourselves from that, but it's the nature of the beast that as a project grows, particularly in its, you know, in its opening phases, it's going to require updating. Okay, so continuous integration can involve uh, compilation, smoke tests. What else might be done in that build? Style checking. Others? Sometimes unit tests are done. You run a whole set of unit tests against it. Unit tests that the developers created. You'll, you'll run it against it when it's, when it's built. I'll make sure that that last minute check changed by someone didn't break those unit tests. Should the developers be doing that? Yeah, prior to check-in, absolutely, they should be doing it. But it is possible that Two check-ins occurred just about at the same time, and the second one broke, you know, the code that the first one checked in. Um, uh, so, what else might take place? 
And that built? Well, deployments. Deployments to test servers, for example. Um, rebuilding of the database from scratch according to a new schema. The schema might need to be updated uh, in the database. So often it gets rebuilt, populated with test data or what have you. So a lot can take place during that build. And in general, you want that build to have an easy way of notifying people that, that it is working or more importantly, when it fails, the, that the build is broken, okay? Um, okay, so a lot of advantages here in, in avoiding the, um, the big bang that used to afflict uh, a, lot of, a lot of projects. Um, okay, um, so here's you know, some, um, some, some features might take place. Here's an ant script uh, that, that might characterize different steps that we saw, saw last time. Um, I, I noted sort of the steps here associated with sort of different categories of code. So, you know, we have, we have checked in, code in development, we have code that's unit tested, um, code to be merged into the, to the repository, code undergoing smoke tests, and, um, and then some later code that might, uh, might need uh, further, further modifications due to bugs uh, that have been found today, et cetera. Um, so uh, the goal here is to build this daily build from scratch every time it occurs. Developers are working in their private sandbox, but before they push, they should be compiling uh, on their own, and they should be compiling on their local box or their local development station. They should be getting people's latest code before checking it. Why do that? Why, why not just compile your code and, and check in? Why should you refresh against other people's code? Why should you pull their, their changes? Well, someone else might have checked your code while they were working. Yeah, exactly. And that code might affect their code, right? So if they don't pull against it, they'll be checking their code into repository where other people will get the newest versions of both and the code won't work. So those individuals should be refreshing at least once a day against the code. They should be pulling other changes, right? Um, and they should do a clean build from scratch against those other changes, having run unit tests, run the, run the smoke test, if at all possible, on their code before pushing. Does that make sense? Just to prevent from stomping on each other? toes. Um, so, you know, generally speaking, um, you're going to have developers trying to emulate what's going on on the continuous integration side in terms of the build before they check in to avoid, um, to avoid, you know, unnecessarily pushing something that needs to be retracted and so on. Um, okay. Um, you know, so I went over a lot of this. I'm just trying to get the, um, the thinking through you, and a key element of this is is uh, coordination and, and awareness of what's going on. And different teams have used different ways of letting people know about a broken build or a um, or a problematic build that that needs resolution. Um, you know, there are um, there are serious ramifications if a build breaks because you want to act on it really quickly so that people don't pull it. If it's broken, you don't want people to get it. That's the whole point of the smoke test. Make sure that people don't get broken code. So you want them to act quickly, and often the build master gets on it and the person who broke it, the person who did that check-in. Uh, you, you want to be careful about you know, having too many emails from the build server or other emails that are mixed in with them so that the, the broken ones get, get missed. Um, so a couple of build principles. This is from a, a good book on du by Duval. Um, commit code frequently. Um, they recommend at least once a day. Um, it's really in logical chunks. And if that's that's once a day, that's that's great. Um, you don't commit code that's not working. You don't commit code that's halfway there. You know, just to get into the repository, you'll break other people's builds potentially. Um, if builds break, you, those are the top priority. You don't do further development after that. 
What would what might happen if you did further development before fixing that that build that's broken? Why might that be adverse? Yeah, exactly. You're creating a you're further building on buggy code or, or problematic code in a way that might itself have to be thrown away, reworked. And you're just layering potentially more things that have to be reworked. Um, your, your fixing of that build may alert you to things that you need to take into account when adding to it. So you want to you wanna build that immediately. Besides, other people may be counting on getting that code because they need to work. They need to do their work in the next few hours because they have another big deliverable two days from now for a different class. They need to work right now. And if you just leave that build broken, you're putting them in bad straits because they can't get their work done while this, while this build is, is, uh, is broken. Um, so developer tests, uh, particularly unit tests, you know, make sure that you can run your tests in an automated fashion. Um, and hopefully they can be woven into unit testing on the server side uh, during the build. You don't want to just be able to run tests manually. A lot of students come into this class having just run manual tests before. Um, that just doesn't scale. You know, it doesn't scale to, to um, the, the size of project we're dealing with here, the complexity of the software. It does not scale to professional work, workflow. Um, you want those tests automated so they can be easily rerun from a, from a test harness. Um, uh, tests and inspections have to pass before this. Developers should be running private builds um, on their own machine. And uh, you want to avoid getting code that's broken by others. You want to avoid getting code that others have checked in that's tainted, that's not working, or else you may stop your work. These, hopefully these are common sense, but you know, there's important lessons lessons learned here. And they're sometimes easier said than done. I remember we had a um, we had an issue with uh, running private builds in one of the teams, maybe it was two years ago, where I, I can't remember the exact issue. It may have been that they were running running with different libraries for it was um, maybe different implementations of, um, of Swift on their own box versus what was on the server. And, and so they couldn't compile the code that was meant for the server, so they weren't doing builds before check-in. And, and it ended up causing big, big, big issues. And you know, in the end, if they had dealt with the issue up front and, and really committed to getting everything aligned, um, they could have saved themselves a tremendous amount of time. Instead, they were a bit operating blind and uh, it ended up biting them in terms of what they could test, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, okay, now continuous integration also is, uh, you know, is greatly aided through <coughs> certain practices. Automating unit tests are one of them. Um, we, we talked about that earlier, get it so that they can run. Um, how many people in here have used JUnit or NUnit? Okay. Uh, 370? Or, where, where did you use that? What, it, was it in a class? Yeah, was it 370? Okay, good. Um, so any unit can be used on the uh, .NET side. Um, uh, you, you could use it to set up um, easily with test harnesses that will drive, drive some code. Um, if you're dealing with uh, code that's that is integration needs, so it depends on other components. Um, sometimes these are called component tests, sometimes integration tests. Uh, you know, try to automate this. this. These types of tests are typically require a longer time, and because there are interdependencies between them, this is where mocking can come in as well. So you have one component that depends on several other components. It's not, it's not truly a unit test. It, it depends on other components. And then system tests are going to be tests that put the whole system through its paces as if a user were driving it, but they are often driven without going through the UI. They're just, as it were, simulating by directly calling the, the requisite methods and so on what would result if the user went through the UI. So, you know, the UI, the user presses a button and it ends up 
invoking an event handler that calls off to some method. So you just directly call that method in your system tests. So you have a, a test harness, and it is calling these methods, which are the same methods the user would call if they you know, started a system, opened up a document, um, you know, went, went through it, did a search on something, found something, made a modification, saved, and left. So it's a use case, right? You do this, it goes through these steps. That's what a system test is going to be simulating. It's going to be simulating a start to end use case. Some of those will go through the UI, They'll actually be using something like uh, Selenium or water. Are they, have you folks used Selenium before? Water? Okay. I figured probably not, although so, if anyone here is, someone has gone to an internship, you might use it there. And there's a variety of other systems like these that are out there, which basically they drive the system like through a browser. So, so let's suppose you have a website, right? One way you can be testing the website is to drive it through a test harness that may be written in Java on the server side, you'll tell it, you know, go through these steps, access this from the database, and, and you know, perform this update, et cetera. It's putting it through the same uh, use cases. But other tests of this sort are going to go through a browser, and it's kind of as if the, you know, you're simulating what a person does through a browser. It's literally using a browser, and it's, you know, it's clicking on buttons, filling in forms, pressing submit, et cetera and it's going through pages of the system. It's going through the UI. It's a system test. It's putting it through use cases, but it's doing it through a user interface that is the, the main user interface to be used. It's the user's user interface, um, the same one they use. It's just driven in an automated fashion. So Selenium, or if you're dealing with a, um, if you're dealing with a Java system, uh, Abbott is a popular one. Um, a, a, a desktop system, you can use Abbott to kind of press buttons on it and fill in or fill in controls and that sort of stuff. You know, from these controls, fill in edit boxes, etc. So system tests, they should be automated, and they can be automated through the UI or not through the UI. Um, or not through the UI means directly calling methods that are the same ones that would be called through the UI. Does that make sense, this idea? And the idea is, Testing the pieces doesn't always give you the, the insights. If you want to catch the sort of bugs that Stymie uses, sometimes you have to go through a whole use case. And you find, oh, you can only search one. You know, the, the, only the first search one. You're not going to find that if you just test the search functionality, perhaps in, in isolation. You want to you do it in the context of the system. And you want to come up with tests. And so a lot of the things the testers are going to be thinking about are these are these system level tests? Um, so so these system level tests. I'm kind of combining together functional tests and system level tests. But basically, these are user oriented tests that are testing large areas of the system. Okay, putting it through its paces in a way similar to what a user would do. Automate, 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 automate. Beyond that, the tester is going to be doing a whole lot of of manual testing, and that's how it should be. Manual testing lets you sniff out issues. You notice the system's kind of slow there, so you start focusing on that issue, and you see if you can get it to, you know, hang up or behave behave uh, uh, improperly um, in terms of its responses. You sense something's wrong. That's the sort of thing we can pursue manually, but it's hard to pursue in an automated way. But an automated way, we can rerun these things. And they can be rerun while you're sleeping. They can be rerun on an ongoing basis every day. Make sense? What's the big problem with these automated tests? I mentioned it earlier. What's the vulnerability with an automated test? Um, if your system changes, the correctness of the test might not be. Correctness and even the <coughs> might not comply. Because you're calling off to this method foo, foo bar, and it's actually become two methods called, guess what? Yeah, foo and separately bar. Um, so, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, sometimes, you know, the, the underlying API evolves. 
and as a result, you got to rework these tests. Um, automated tests are estimated to cost. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this. This might dissuade you. They're estimated to cost in robo projects something like ten times as much human time to create and maintain as comparable unit tests. Now that might scare you, but of course they could be run a thousand times as often as unit as human tests, right? Because trying to get someone to click, 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 and you know try this and so on, it's incredibly tedious. But you could run these things every night or whatever. There's a real trade-off there. They, they require time. They require time to create. They require time to then maintain in a big way. Okay. Um, right. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to the testing area, and I think I'll leave th these other ones here. Um, database integration. Um, happy to see the project descriptions. Excited uh, by those projects. Um, all of those projects are going to require some sort of database. Hmm? They're all going to require some sort of database functionality. And you're going to have to deal with this database. And maybe you're used to dealing with databases that are sitting on your local machine. You have a local MySQL installation and you're used to just kind of throbbing that locally. And you know, that's okay, but now you've got to deal with the fact that you're gonna be testing your code against the database that lives elsewhere. And so at the least, the, you know, uh, the security side might be changing. You won't be logging in with, with your own username and password. And you wanna be dealing with this database as it evolves over time, because databases evolve with the code, right? As the code evolves, the database evolves. What's stored, what the code knows about, what the code can put into the database, these things are gonna change, right? So the database schema has got to evolve with the code. And that schema needs to be stored with the code base. It's a document. It's got, to, it's got to be stored because if you want to roll back to the previous version because that latest feature just did not work out and you've got the deliverable due tonight at midnight, you want to roll back to the version as it was yesterday where at least it was very stable. Um, you want to be able to roll back to that earlier schema, right? Does that make sense? I mean, if you, if you can't, now your old code won't work with the new schema potentially. So you, you want the repository to be to be current, to give the full content to that system. And so you're going to need to, you need to be maintaining the database in a professional way by keeping it as part of your repository. And, you know, as part of your automated build, you often want to rebuild your database and insert test data in it because the schema will evolve. You'll also want to refresh that database after a test that's fraud the data in there. You want to, you know, dump it get rid of it and clear it and then rebuild it. Because otherwise, if you run that test again, it'll give different results because it's against different data in the database. So databases are one of these things that are, that are awkward for us as developers to deal with because they're sitting out there somewhere, but our code depends on them. And how our code behaves in tests will depend on the contents of that database. So we need to maintain a relationship with this database that's quite quite clear. So, you know, use a local database, sure, that's great. You don't want to be going over the network all the time. But you just need to be clear about the fact that your code is ultimately not going to run against your local database, probably. It's going to be running against, you know, a centralized database that lives somewhere, and maybe it's over, a, over the network, and you're going to be needing that, that code to work in that context, right? Um, so use a version control processor to share those assets um, and don't let the, the database administrator be a, a big bottleneck. Again, this is uh, from, from Duval, which I think is, is good advice. Um, okay. Um, so continuous integration, I've given some recommendations uh, to some of the people who I've spoken to and in the syllabus. Apache Continuum um, has good support for Ant and Maven. 
Shippable is another free database. Uh, Jenkins and Hudson, I get them confused. One was a, one was kind of a, a takeoff on the other. One of them is open source, as I recall. And then there's a set of them that are not open source, but uh, are popular, things like Team City Cruise Control, Travis CI, okay? Um, these are popular. Some of these, I know Travis, for example, has very good integration with GitHub. So you can use it as your CI server on GitHub. It will take care of the set of continuous integration and so on. Um, uh, it may be that continuum does as well. Um, for issue tracking, uh, key issue here is, is being able to track bugs. We'll be coming back to that a lot. But basically when a bug is found, or a defect is found, or when a system trouble incident is found, um, <coughs> When a user has trouble with, with it, when a tester encounters a problem, when the developer encounters a problem with certain other features, um, you want a place to record it. Why do you want a place to record it? So people know about it. People know about it, and so you know whether it gets fixed. Right? There needs to be some accountability here. If it's found, you want to know, is this thing resolved? And you'd like to be able to share information in a structured way about how important this is. What's the level of severity? Is this a crashing bug, or is this a bug that merely an aesthetic, you know, a small aesthetic issue? Um, you know, a weird color issue on certain phones, or it scrolls off the screen on, on small model phones, or it's, you know, there's a misspelling or what have you. Um, but you want to maintain these things. Redmine's a very good uh, free system. Jira is not free, but there's some sort of um, trial and there's some sort of academic terms that are cheaper. The university, uh, our department has track, has a track server, which is good. Um, Say assembly there, um, I, I haven't checked that out in recent years, but uh, that, that used to be a popular one as well. Um, so these are issue tracking, they will track issues. Another good thing to track is, um, is you know, change requests to, uh, to requirements, for example. You could track there, okay? Couple more things here that I wanna cover though. Um, so one thing is, is this issue of, of monitoring progress um, on a task. All your teams are going to live and die by how well they can track the progress that's being made and bring that project progress into sync with the deliverable needs. So you know, when you finish up these incremental deliverables every two to three weeks, you're gonna be wanting to make sure you have a soft landing there, that it, it converges in time for the deliverable. And for the project managers, what that's gonna mean is a need to monitor what's getting done over time, right? You need to know who in your team has done what. What's complete? What's underway? What hasn't been started yet? Mm -hmm. This is going to be a really big need, and it's a big problem because instead of dealing with the three other people you dealt with last term in 370, you're going to be dealing with you know 12 other heads out there, each with their knowledge about their little area of the world, but, but it's going to be hard for you to gather all this stuff. So there really needs to be a coordination effort here to give feedback about what's done. Tools like Google Docs, so Google Sheets is a great tool to you know, check off when things are done. But as we'll say, and as I emphasized before, and I'll emphasize again, it's really important to be clear what does it mean to be done. Is it done done? Is it is it complete in the sense of all the things, or are you just saying it's, you know, I've written the code, just haven't compiled it yet. Um, so task progress is going to be really important. Um, tracking lines of code is sometimes a, a good, good thing to track just to figure out you know, roughly where we're at. Um, person hours, I'm asking you to estimate how long you're putting in. But more than that, I'm asking you to estimate how long you think this task will take versus how long it actually takes. And I am not going to penalize that at all. That's a great opportunity for learning. It's, I'm not gonna, you know, if someone says they thought it would take 10 minutes and it took 10 days, I'm not gonna view that 
badly, I'm gonna I'm gonna think, oh, okay, great, you recorded that. Hopefully there's a lesson learned there. Murphy's Law. Uh, you know, we just sometimes miss complexities. So we'll talk about ways to avoid missing some of those complexities and thinking through in a structured way what we have to do in later lectures. Um, build and release project. You know, how many builds have occurred in the past day? How many check-ins? How, uh, how many of those broke, if any? Um, defect counts. The project managers are going to want to keep track of defect counts in a big way. So let me ask this. Is a small defect count a good sign or a bad sign? So why might it be a bad sign? Yeah, they're there. You just haven't found them yet. So, um, you know, often there's worse before better. Before you can get better, um, you got to find the defects. You got to locate them. So if you're finding lots of defects, in many ways that's a good sign because it puts you in a position to fix them, right? Um, on the other hand, that's not the only thing you look at. You look at number of tests passed. Number of tests attempted, right? Um, fraction of those that have passed. Morale, another thing to monitor. This is, this is a key thing. A lot of these, ladies and gentlemen, are symptoms of underlying dynamics, underlying drivers. This is a, this is a big driver. This is a really big driver for uh, progress on your, on your um, on your projects. The morale um, side of the equation, uh, it might not be having absolutely immediate key impact, but it's going to collectively, over time, it's going to have a huge impact on your ability to sustain effective progress. So don't just get caught up in the obviously quantifiable ones. Those are important, but be trying to think, fly ahead of the plane and think, okay, what are driving these and how are we doing on that side? Another one, besides morale is, um, is uh, knowledge. How well is it spread across the team? Because if it's, if it's tied up just to certain individuals, you know, that's the only person who knows about Swift, or this other person is the only one who knows SQL. You're cruising for a bruising. So the ability to spread knowledge around, knowledge of style, knowledge of, of, of the technologies involved, this is really important. Um, the degree to which people are cooperating that's going to have a really big impact, you know, in the multi-month time frame, and compared to, um, to uh, you know, just the, the symptoms uh, we see here. Okay, um, so we'll we'll talk more about that. Uh, this is just a, a strict uh, overview. Okay, the key thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is to have binary completion of tasks. You need to be very careful about avoiding the situation where you you are. Um, you're stuck in a situation where there's a lot of tasks underway, but none of them are really done, done. They're, they're underway, they're mostly done, they just haven't been checked in yet, they haven't, they haven't um, you know, been tested against refreshed code, or they were tested a week ago, but they haven't been checked in and people have got to refresh the code. You want binary completion. Is this thing complete, full stop? Um, and by that, I would suggest that you be very clear in your team what this means. This is, this is one idea. It's implemented, yeah. The code's written. It's been united, smoke tested. Re any release notes have been updated, documentation related things. It's checked in, and, and therefore it's ready for, for uh, quality assurance. You know, it's, all, all these things can happen. And naturally in here there's a compilation too. So you want to be very clear about what it means for this to be done as far as the task. Now, does this mean it will never come back? No, not at all. The fact that it's done means it's ready for quality assurance and maybe it'll be knocked back, but at least we know, you know, this iteration of it is, is complete. So project managers, be aware that you, you got to get beyond the kind of it's mostly done, it's kind of done to, you know, it, it is checked in and ready to go. And before that, it's been, it's been uh, run through. Okay, um, so I am looking for some basic metrics and, and sort of binary milestones, like what, what were the steps needed um, 
uh, for, th for this uh, deliverable uh, so that you can check them off. I'm actually not gonna be looking at those much, but for your sake, you wanna know, these are the steps we need to undertake to have a hope of getting that in in time. Okay, most of what I'm gonna be spending the remaining time on has to do with testing. Okay, um, risk driven testing. If I had my druthers, and I don't, if I had my druthers, um, I would have a class required for all software engineers in training here that would be focused on quality assurance and testing. And that class would provide a rigorous introduction to testing and, and yes, debugging methodologies um, that, that could put you in really good stead for professional development. Instead, um, we have to kind of fit it in through the cracks uh, in this course. It's an important component, but it's not something that I can, I can spend the full semester on. But I want to talk with you about what's expected on the testing side, because it's a lot different from what I think you would have seen in previous classes. Um, I talked about the early provision of code to testers. You're going to have dedicated testing. I was happy to see all the teams specify. You know, there's a test lead. Sometimes the exact members of the test team were, were spelled out, sometimes not. But there needs to be dedicated testers at any given incremental deliverable. I was also very happy to see a plan to rotate people through positions for some of the teams. That's great. Love it. But um, there needs to be testers on any given incremental deliverable that are, that are focused on testing. So, so again, provision of that code by a deadline. Maybe that means a code freeze deadline two days ahead of the deliverable, after which that code is provided to testers or you know, a midpoint or some code and then two days before the balance of the code or what have you. Designing for testability, we're gonna talk about this, but ladies and gentlemen, the deal is this. When you build your system, you gotta be thinking about testing it. So when, when you write the code, yes, you're thinking about the final use, but you should be also asking, oh, what what could I do with this code that will make it easier to test? Okay, um, what could I do with this code that will make it easier to write a test harness that runs against it, that makes it easier to write assertions that test things, that makes it easier to mock out? What could I do that would allow someone to call it from a harness really easily? Um, so there's this thing called test hooks. And we'll talk about that in a separate session, but basically, and you can search for me online, you'll find me talking about it online. Um, test hooks basically provide a mechanism for tests to look inside of an object, amongst other things, um, and to potentially modify what's there. For example, um, they might check an internal data structure in this object to make sure some invariant is, is true. Um, they might, um, instead of just depending on the return value, here at sort of what intermediate things were computed along the way to develop confidence the return value is, is sane. Um, sometimes in our code we have kind of big computations or big things that get done and these provide you a way to kind of make sure that it's not a black box. You can, you can look inside it. In other cases what we do is we provide a way to test our code by, um, by setting an error condition by basically getting that code to, we trigger an error. So we, we can make it so as if this code experienced the disk fall error and see how it, see how it reacts. Or an out-of-memory error, or a network disconnection error, or a slow network error. Why would that be a good thing to do? Why would you want to be able to tell your code the network disconnection has occurred? Yeah? You don't want it to crash when it happens? You want to handle it? Yeah. And, and you don't want to have to, you know, unplug the Ethernet cable to make it happen, right? You don't want to, you don't want to have to make it run out of memory um, to actually see what happens. You want to have to fill up your disk with nonsense files to see how it deals with the disk out of memory or, or disk out of space error. You want, you want to be able to simulate that within the code. There are tools that will do this for you. Uh, a number of years back, there was a cool uh, tool called Canned Heat. 
and you could run it on Windows boxes. And basically, it would it would set things up to pretend as if you know memory was exhausted or the disk was full or the network was slow or, or what have you. And you'd see how your code <coughs> functioned under those stressful conditions. I know we as developers don't like, <laughs> there's something unpleasant about that prospect. But look, your code may face those things. It's gotta be able to, you wanna have confidence it can handle them gracefully, or at least it won't corrupt memory or you know, uh, lose lots of data or what have you. So test hooks are ways of sort of explicitly putting in place things in your code that will allow it to be tested. Um, some other things along the line, specifications. I asked you to put them into place for this, uh, for this project, preconditions, postconditions. Why do those help te testability? make it really quite a lot easier to write assertions. Another good practice here. They make it really easy to, to write little test cases for this. Um, specifications make it a lot easier to test. And testability. Uh, Interface-based programming. Programming against interfaces. Why does that help testability? So instead of writing your code to manipulate this this uh, this class itself, you write it to to sort of uh, to to operate on instances of an interface. Why does that help? Yeah. If you test the interface functions and know they'll work wherever you use them, you don't have to test every single other function. Good, good. Yeah. So you're testing the parts of it that external code might depend on. For example, you know all the code depends on just these methods that are implemented by this interface. So those are the ones that you'll be focusing your testing on. So I like that. What else? Begins with an M, ends with an I, has a CK in the middle of it. <coughs> After that, it has an I. <laughs> After that, it has an N. Um, mock it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, mocking. Um, mocking, ladies and gentlemen. You can mock out something that's depending only on the interface. You can swap in a new class that implements that interface. Hmm? Yeah, that was, that was getting pretty catchy. Mocking, a mookie. <laughs> um, mocking. Um, uh, okay, so. So ladies and gentlemen, interface-based programming is also allows easier testing, both through, you, you can use formal mocking tools, JMock, Makita, what have you, similar things um, uh, for other languages, or you can use, uh, you, you can manually substitute out a, a class. So instead of going off over the network to hit the server to read back some data, you have a mocked version that you manually created that's going to just read it from a local database, or read it from a config file. Does that make sense? Okay, so by programming those interfaces, your code is not coupled to this particular implementation class. All it knows is I'm dealing with something that, that, that implements this interface, and so you can substitute in something else instead of the class you normally deal with. Hmm? Helps testability. Helps you nimbly test your code. Mm. Um, unit testing by developers against specifications. And along with this, incidentally, is assertions. I want to see them. Assertions, ladies and gentlemen, should be legion. They should be, there should be massive numbers arrayed before me as I read your code. Um, and uh, they should be ubiquitous through the code. Um, and uh, I want to see them put into place based particularly on, on specifications. You know, assertions based on specifications, if you have the specification, the assertions are almost a freebie there. You translate the specifications as captured in comments into an assertion. Hmm? Yeah, almost a freebie. Um, 
I'd like to see uh, mocking in place. There's mocking frameworks for JavaScript, mocking frameworks for Java, mocking frameworks for .NET. I mean, there's mocking frameworks for lots of different platforms. Um, so I'd like to see that. Okay, another feature that I'd like to see. I, you know, originally, this was a later, later lecture. These are subsets, but I figure the sooner I get these in place, the better, because the test team should be thinking about these things. Ladies and gentlemen, testing is not easy. Testing, testing requires a lot of thinking. And, and when we're thinking about it, there's a lot of different dimensions we gotta deal with. And one of the best things you can do is to structure your thinking by what's called, creating what's called a test matrix. Because one of the foremost things we think about when asking about testing is, what's our coverage? What are we testing? And by implication, what are we not testing? Hmm? What is our code not reaching? What is our code not, not yet probing? And the way in which you do this is you'll create a table. This is called a test matrix, okay? Test matrix. And you might have more than one. As you can see, there's different variants of this. And here we could have in the columns successive test cases these might be system tests or functional tests, these, these higher level tests that put the system through its, paces, through its paces. And so you'd have test case one, test case two, test case three. Maybe they have nice names associated with them. Um, on the rows here are going to be features of the system that you're testing. You know, maybe it's features associated with submitting that safety report anonymously or not anonymously, or maybe you know, submitting it with a photo or not. Um, maybe it's something to do with you know dealing with property listings from this from MLS or from a different vendor. Um, so these are going to be different features, and for each system, they're going to be different. So this might be feature, you know, one, and so on, right? And Basically, what's going to go here is a checkbox. You know, this test case tested these two features. This test case tests just this one. Now, what am I going to be looking for here? What are you going to be looking for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to be looking for gaps in the form of like rows that are entirely empty, because that indicates the feature is not being tested by any of the available tests. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll also want to see, with test cases, this will help you think, what is this actually testing? And occasionally, you will see something like, <coughs> ah, it's not clear what feature it's testing. Maybe, maybe this test is now updated. A feature that it tested is is now gone and it's not really testing anything, or it's testing just another time that's something that's tested by almost everything else. In which case, you've got to wonder, is this really worth it to maintain you know, further? Is it really worth it to update it every time, et cetera? Um, and this gets back to an issue which I don't have to be on here, which is called traceability. And the idea there is that you want to have some sense of where these test cases are coming from. Like, what, what are they? What higher level things are they testing? What requirements? What features? You want to know something about, about what they depend on. And the same thing with code, ladies and gentlemen. Presumably, all the code in your system ultimately comes, directly or indirectly, through a requirement. From a requirement. But sometimes you'll find there's you know, bits of code there. It's not clear what, fun what purpose they, they served. Maybe they're dead code, they're not used at all. Um, or they're only used by certain things that depend on each other and they don't really serve a meaningful purpose anymore. That can be cleared away for this version, right? After all, we're using uh, a source code repository where we can always roll back to earlier versions, but we can get rid of this corrupt code. It's vestigial, okay? Um, so you're going to have one or more test matrices that I'd like to see relating tests to features or requirements. What have you. Is that clear? Yeah. Um, manual and automated testing. I want to see both in your, 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 your 
projects. There should be some manual testing going on. But if it's all manual testing, there's a bad problem. It's a bad problem because it's not sustainable. It's not scalable. Um, you want automated testing. Um, you want to be able to rerun that test that you ran before now that this code base has been updated. Rerun it. And it's really easy to do if it's automated. You could have it rerun regularly. Um, and there should be these system tests that put system or functional, I'm not going to make a big distinction there, but it puts it through use cases. And critically, I'm going to introduce a methodology. I can't do it today. I'm going to introduce a methodology for you to think through the structure of your system from the perspective of a user's flow through the system. Like, what are the, the, easy, the easiest way to think about it might be, what are the what are the screens that the user can get to on that app you're building? Or what are the, what are the pages they can get to? And I'm not talking about necessarily distinct URLs, but, but functionally distinct pages they can get to when going through a certain use case on, on the website, right? These are kind of flows through the system that the user can undertake tasks successfully. And, and there's going to be links between them. You can get to this page from that page, um, but not vice versa or what have you. Um, same thing with the app. You know, maybe you can you know, successfully enter information, but once you submit, you can't go back to the earlier ones or what have you. So you should be thinking about like what are these pages? What can you get to from what? You can create a, um, a directed acyclic graph with that. Actually, it can be cyclic. It doesn't have to be acyclic. Um, but the point is, um, it diagrams at an abstract level your system and its connectivity, its, its, its functionality. And then, having done that, um, you should be reasoning about, OK, which of these have we tested? It's another type of coverage. This is one sort of coverage to spot gaps. Another is there. Like, what tests have tested each of those pages? Right? Eh? Nah. Um, if you're too quiet, I may sleep up here sometimes. Um, until you can get an answer. Um, I won't do that. But, but seriously, I'd like to hear hear some responses. Um, so, so ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, thinking about the system at an abstract level can also help you think about okay, what have we covered? What have we reached in our testing? And there's a formal thing called coverage testing. And there are tools out there like Cobertura that will quantify what fraction of the statements in your system have you, have you hit in your testing. So if you have a set of tests, it will instrument things. So when you run those tests, it's going to keep track of where is this reached. And you know if you can get 80 plus percent coverage, I'll be really impressed. Do you think? If your test cases have reached a given point within the code base, does that mean the code base is free of bugs there? No. But if they've never reached it at all, how much confidence do you have the code base there is free of bugs? Not a lot. <laughs> the code never even reached there to test it. You know, there's not a lot of evidence on which to base the statement, this is robust code. It, it may be. Maybe that that code prints out an Easter egg message that you know is uh, is it has little to do with delivering features to the to the uh, user and you'd never see it. Okay, a few other suggestions here. Um, testing. Students seem perhaps if there's one topic students seem most lost about how to proceed with testing. I am very pleased to tell you that um, over the years I've accumulated a large, good library of, of books related to testing. I also regret to tell you some of the best ones have been taken by students, but that's another matter. Um, I like to see them consulted. And I do have some good books in testing, and I can refer you to others. The books by Kaner, K-A-N-E-R, are really practical, good books. Um, and uh, there's a number of others as well that, I'll ha that I have in my office, Jaskiel. Um, 
uh, is pretty good. These are very practical books on how to test, how to create test cases, how to think systematically about testing. But I'd like to give you some very high level suggestions. First of all, one is the most important perhaps of all. It's the meta one. And yes, it's important for your projects here, but it's even more important for your career. When you find problems with your project, yes, act on them quickly to fix them in most cases. I'll come back to that. Why not? In most cases. But the most important thing is to debug your process. What do I mean by debug your process? Good, yes, and you should be asking two big questions in this case, so that's good, excellent. Two big questions in this case. Number one, why did that defect get introduced in the first place? Give me some reasons why the defect might have gotten introduced in the first place. Oversight. Okay, so, so oversight, um, <coughs> It's kind of a blunt term. It can be oversight for different reasons. Let's, let's try to get a little bit more specific than that. So I like that as a start, but, but. Lack of communication between developers. Lack of communication between developers. One person didn't know what the other person <coughs> had done or was doing. How about another concrete thing? That's good. Um, uh, how about another thing? A misunderstanding of the technology. That can easily happen. Another? Lack of planning. I guess that's kind of communication. Yeah, um, it's a lack of, of, of sort of clear responsibilities, who is responsible for this part so it doesn't fall through the cracks, yeah? That's good. Um, other things? It's actually, there's actually a, a lot of very specific reasons things fall through the cracks. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a topic people have looked into considerable amount. Misunderstanding of a language is another thing. Um, uh, you know, failure to update your understanding from the latest version. This is a very concrete case of lack of coordination. It's like, I'm operating with the old understanding, but now the database has been changed in its structure, and I didn't, I wasn't updated because of that. And so it's not just that I didn't know what the situation was. I, I, I was operating with an up-to-date, an out-of-date model. These are, these are things that ladies and gentlemen, uh, left us vulnerable to this defect coming in. Defects are not like lightning bolts that come out of the blue and blow away our code. They're, they're things that we leave ourselves vulnerable to. I mean, lightning actually, uh, even, even lightning, we you know, do gratuitous things to leave ourselves open, right? We, we traipse through an open field or, or, uh, or go sailing in the, in, in, in the midst of a thunderstorm or what have you. But the point is that we leave ourselves vulnerable to these things. And if you can think, what was it that we left ourselves vulnerable to led this to come about, you can help lower those vulnerabilities in many cases. Maybe not in all. Maybe there's some things that are you know, really hard to control. But in many, you can. What's the second question? And speak as if in a single voice. What can we do about it? OK, yeah. and I. So, so I like that. How can we fix the process? So that's a really big question. But there's actually another one that, that you would ask retrospectively. Why did this go undetected for so long? Why didn't we? So given that it was introduced, why didn't we catch it earlier? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very important question. How, or let's turn this around. Because I don't want to make it sound like a witch hunt or a, you know, a, a, a self-flagellation. The point is. How could we have caught it sooner? How could we have prevented this from coming in? What could we have done that would have prevented this from coming in? So here you're debugging not just your code base, but your process. Does that make sense? And, and to do so in a way that's it's 
not a shameful thing. It's just asking, how can we do even better? That's what mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, in life leave us open to. It's a question, you know, how can we do better next time? What can we do to, to, um, to prevent this from being a problem the next time around? Test driven development is something that, that can really uh, aid things. You know, make the tests ahead of time, make it run, and then make it right. Make make the uh, make it pass the test and then, then sort of uh, refactor it so that it, that it's even better. Um, but making it run first means often failing the test. So first you you run it, you confirm it fails the test, then you get it to pass the test, and then you think of something about about uh, fixing that further. Use a bug tracking system. A red mine's a great one. Uh, the one in GitHub is pretty good to track uh, track the bugs. Then you can ask, okay, what sort of bugs are we getting? Where are they coming from? Uh, build for testability from the start. We talked about that. Automate most tests. Uh, tests that start manual can be automated. Oh yeah, that found a bug, great. If it found a bug now, get it in an automated test. Why? It's, it's done its job, why? We found the bug. Why do we put in the effort to make an automated test? Yeah, why could a bug pop up again? Let's be very concrete. Why could it pop up again? People could forget that that caused the bug. They, sorry? People could forget that that caused the bug before? Yeah, that's right. They can make the same logical mistake. So that's one way. What's another way? Emerging changes. That is it. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you roll back, sometimes. You, you know, you have a merge conflict and someone ends up stomping this change that fixed the bug with an older version of it, and guess what? It reappears. Mm -hmm. um, so this is part of regression testing. You're testing against old bugs to make sure they don't reappear. Because there's a pretty good, ch good chance that they might. Because you know, with dealing with different versions of the code and merge conflicts, etc. Um, manual testers gather a great deal of op often understand about where the code base is weak, where it's behaving flaky, that goes beyond just bugs. You know, there's it's updating really slow for this, or you know, it seemed to get, it seemed to cause a problem there, but I wasn't sure if it was a network disconnection, so I'm not gonna call it a defect, because I don't know that, but, but it could be problematic there. And you wanna focus your testing in areas they think is, are soft, that you, they're a little bit suspicious about that. So use their, <laughs> use their nose to sort of spot particular um, areas. Um, bug reports, bug reports, ladies and gentlemen, are a sensitive topic. Why do I say they're sensitive? Why do you have to be careful in writing your bug reports? Yeah, you don't sound accusatory, you don't sound you don't sound dismissive, you don't sound condescending. You know, yet another of of your bugs or why don't you learn to code in Swift? Or something like I mean, no, seriously, people's emotions sometimes get up, and there's just no room for that in professional software development. I mean, it just unnecessarily causes problems in your team. And those problems in your team between people turn into problems in your code base, problems in your, in your bug repository. So you really want bug reports that are to the point, that are not personal, that, that are just you know, observing this, and to make it clear what's going on, how to reproduce it, how to, how to recreate that bug readily, um, that are put in some efforts, and we'll talk more about that. Pair testing, buddy testing, these are, are, are great um, initiatives. Pair testing, basically two people test uh, side by side. One, you know, one person has ideas about how to test it, the other says, well, we haven't tested that case yet, let's try that. Or, you know, um, oh, that's really interesting. Did you see that? The other person didn't see it, and, and the first one pointed out. And so you can get quicker conversions. And you get shared knowledge between the two, right? Even with a novice and an expert, this can be very useful. It can spread knowledge, can help, help catch things, et cetera. Buddy testing is where one developer tests, does the unit testing for the other developer and vice versa. So you have developers kind of testing each other's code. 
and it leads to less sympathetic testing. Less, like, I'm going to show my work and, and more, more, more sort of take you outside the box. Um, right. Um, okay. Um, plan the test environment. Uh, so you're going to need an environment for testing for the testers. This is a different environment. They're going to need potentially their own version of the database um, that they can use and, and test. It won't be stomped on by just the latest uh, build, et cetera. Um, after test, they should reset the state of the database. Why do I say that? Why should they reset the state of the database after a test? Yeah, the tests need to be reproduced. That's, that's a fundamental thing. The tests need to be reproduced. You want them to run the test. Each time you get the same result. It should be functional. And in order for it to be functional, it needs anything it depends on externally needs to be in a defined state. And so if it's depending on a database or files, those need to all be restored following the test. Or else you spot something, you say, man, I want to get to that again. So you run it again, and it doesn't generate because it's based on a different baseline. So you need to reset the state, whether it's based on files, or databases, or a network connection, or whatever. You need to, to reset it. Um, I think that's, uh, uh, that's good. OK, a um, couple more things in here. And I'm going to have to the triage here to just cover things that are, that are essential. Uh, plan some for non-functional testing, if at all possible. Stress testing your system under stressful conditions, low memory, uh, out of disk space, those sort of things we talked about. And uh, load testing. So testing your system as the number of users goes up, for example. Think about that. How does it scale? Mm -hmm. um, uh, number of processors, um, potentially. Um, isolate the test and development environments. Um, you want testers to have a, have a different uh, different environment. And perform some exploratory tests manually, for sure. Um, try to automate these regression tests. And look for re-emergence re of a bug. Um, and uh, you know, with, with testing tools, um, uh, there, there are some specialized testing tools that will allow you to test your system under specialized conditions or, or help maintain um, test, uh, test harnesses. That would be useful. And try to do a code freeze prior to deliverable a few days. Final thing I want to just mention here, we have about a minute left, is there is a systematic staging of, of a code within your system. And I want you to start thinking about this. You need to start having a common language, if possible, about this. Um, if we think about defects, there's defects that are yet undiagnosed. There's defects that are reported, but, but are not yet checked. Not yet checked for duplicates, or whether they're outdated, or whether they're based on misunderstandings. These are, are bug reports that are kind of raw. They might not even have priorities attached to them. They certainly haven't been assigned to anyone. There's a process called sanitization that basically takes those bug reports, these kind of raw ones, and basically sifts through them and figures out what are the unique ones? What are the ones that are, that are, that are real? They're real, they're current, they're unique. They're legit, and there's enough information in them to, to make sense of. These are what we call active bugs. The process of sanitization is a non-trivial process. It involves wading through and saying, oh, that's a duplicate of this other one. Oh, this one we already fixed last rev. It's just a they must be operating with an older version of the system, et cetera. Once you get to the active bug stage, these are bugs that are, are real bugs. They've been prioritized, typically. You prioritize them, and you assign a severity. Severity is how serious they are. Do they crash the system? Do they cause data loss, et cetera? Priority is how urgent are they to fix? How important are they to fix? The process of triage is basically saying, okay, this is a bug worth fixing for this round. You triage it, and that gets into important bugs, which then get assigned. Eventually, hopefully someone believes they're fixed, but it's not until the reporter or someone of similar authority <coughs> confirms that it's been fixed, that their view is resolved, 
and then the test team can mark it as closed. Case closed. It's done. This is the process of dealing with defects. And the most important thing you should be thinking about for much of your project is this one, the undiagnosed one. Because that is the unknown unknown. You don't know what is there. Okay? And class is over for today. Thank you very much. I've tried to give you a condensed form, some best practices. Next time we'll transition to Okay? Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.